It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, the situation in our hospitals right now is critical. In a rare and historic moment, the five largest health care unions in Ontario have joined together to condemn this government's inaction on the response to the crisis in our health care system. Together, they represent 295,000 frontline health care workers who feel disrespected and undervalued by this government. This government has consistently failed to listen to frontline workers. Will the Premier and Minister of Health agree to meet with public health care leaders and implement their solutions? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, I uh, meet regularly with health care providers, health care leaders in the industry because I want to hear about their innovative solutions. And, you know, the investments that we are making and the changes that we are making in the short, medium, and long term really truly are making a difference. Uh, would I like to see it go faster? Absolutely. But I am not going to shy away from continually highlighting the fact that it is our government and this Premier that has made the investments in health care system, including the addition of two new medical schools in the province of Ontario, one in Brampton and one in Scarborough. Unprecedented historic investments. You know, the last time we saw an expansion in medical schools in the province of Ontario, Speaker, was a previous Conservative government. We had a health care system that desperately needed attention. It is getting that with this government, and we will continue to make those investments. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, again to the Premier. We know how little this government cares about frontline workers in our health care yeah. system. It appears they're starving the public health care system to manufacture a crisis and create a reliance on for-profit companies. We're already seeing hospitals and long-term care homes being forced to rely on agency staff and being gouged by the prices that they charge. And instead of investing in permanent, full-time staff, this government has instructed Ontario Health to cut even more resources from staff. How can the Premier justify reducing spending on health care staff during a health care human resource crisis? Minister Health. You know, it doesn't matter how many times you repeat a falsehood, it's still a falsehood. I'm going to ask the minister to withdraw and, and answer. The facts spell a very different story. You know, where was the member opposite when we were investing? Where was the member opposite when we actually put money in the budget that was going to give a $5,000 retention uh, fee for our very, very hardworking nurses in the province of Ontario. The member opposite and his party chose not to support those investments. Where was the member opposite when we expanded the number of residency uh, positions available in the province so that in rural, northern, and all parts of Ontario, we would have more family physicians, more health care professionals being able to practice in the province of Ontario? They voted against that. We will continue with our most recent budget, a $5 billion increase in the health Health care budget to make those investments. I'd like to see the member opposite. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the minister can cite all kinds of numbers. Talk to the people who are waiting in the emergency rooms order. today. Come, Talk come to the order. people in the emergency rooms order. and find out what's real and order. what's not real. Speaker, this government has no intention of listening to frontline health care workers. Unions representing hundreds of thousands of workers are urgently calling for the public Order. sector solutions that this government is not interested in them. We have the space, we have the capacity in our health system. All we need is the political will from this government to repeal one, Bill 124, to improve workloads, to incentivize health care workers to remain in the system instead of driving them out. Will the Premier commit to the solutions proposed by health care workers to improve access and quality of care in Ontario? Where was the member opposite 
when we directed the College of Nurses of Ontario to quickly review and expedite and license, when appropriate, new internationally educated here, here. nurses in the province of Ontario. They did not support that. Where was the member opposite when we, through a directive, said to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, we have internationally educated primary care physicians who want to work in the province of Ontario. We want you to assess, review, and when appropriate, license them. Where was the member opposite? Again, did not support these changes. We will continue to work with all health care providers in the yeah. province of Ontario when they bring forward innovative ideas, and we will continue to fund those innovations because we understand Response? the people of Ontario deserve better than what they've been getting for the last 20 years. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Yesterday, I asked the minister to do much better for Ontario's youth in care. This government has known about children suffering in for-profit group homes like Hats Off for years. In 2018, the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth was circulating a draft report to ministry officials raising concerns about the safety of children in these homes. The report found, on a regular basis, vulnerable youth were subjected to inadequate care and inhumane punishments. In 2019, the Conservatives fired the Provincial Advocate and eliminated the office altogether. Curious timing, don't you think? Even worse, the government's own inspection reports of group homes detailed bathrooms covered in black mold, smeared blood on walls, and children sleeping on soiled mattresses. This government knew. They've known for four years, and yet these Question. vulnerable children continue to suffer under their care. Why hasn't the government taken meaningful action to help children living in these group homes? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the, the member opposite makes an important point that our government did know and at that time that more reports were not going to be helpful. The evidence was there, and that's exactly why we are redesigning the child welfare system and implementing very important measures that we are monitoring, making publicly transparent, and uh, increasing the inspections, increasing the number of inspectors, increasing the number of um, unannounced inspections. All of these are measures that are making a difference. We're increasing the data collection in a meaningful way. We're consulting with the youth and people with lived experience in the system to make the system better. Their voices matter. We are listening to their voices. We are implementing uh, a child welfare redesign. It is very important work, as, as you have outlined, Response. and we are taking action on this all this time, and we'll continue to do that very important work. Great. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. When you're talking about transparency, maybe you shouldn't have fired the provincial child advocate who raised the alarm bells with you. Four years under this government, these children continue to be abused. Continue to be abused. That's not action on the part of governments. That is neglect. This isn't just a failure of hats off. It's a massive failure of this conservative government. They virtually abandoned these children. Children in the care system are subject to physical restraints, little to no food, over medicating, and cruel punishments, including prolonged isolation. Dwayne Ferguson, like Cassidy Frank, was unable to access the care and support he needed at a hats off group home in Hamilton. Cassidy thankfully got out, but Dwayne tragically died by suicide outside of a hats off home in 2014. Yesterday, I asked the minister to commit to pursuing an investigation into hats off, and she refused. Speaker, Will the minister commit today to a full investigation into hats off Question. so that no child spends another day in these horrific conditions and no more children die in care? Yes or no? And I remind members to make a comment to the chair right across the floor of the House. Minister to reply. Thank you, Speaker. I repeat once again. This is exactly why we are implementing a new child welfare system. This is part of our child welfare redesign, something that the previous government never did, something that you supported the previous government not to do. So we are, making, we are doing the work that you never did, and we're making a difference in the lives of children. We are providing more oversight, more accountability. These are important measures. We don't need more reports. We know what needs to be done, and we're doing it, something that you never did. Thank That's you. Right. Well
Once again, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And while the minister tries to play politics and shirk responsibility, there are children that are Order. literally dying in these homes. Speaker, I'm starting to see a really disturbing pattern with this Conservative government. They aren't doing anything to address the crisis in our children's hospitals. They aren't providing adequate funding to our schools. They aren't addressing the growing wait list for autism services. They aren't supporting kids in the care system. It's like they don't care about the kids at all. Speaker, will the minister commit to a full investigation into Hats Off today? Minister. Well, you've definitely identified who's playing politics. We, we are putting more money into the child welfare system for the redesign to address human trafficking, to address sexual abuse, to address the inferior uh, situations in some homes. Some homes have been closed. We are improving the oversight. We are improving the accountability. We are improving the inspections. We are improving the number of inspectors. We are listening to the sector. We are listening to people with lived experience. We have done consultations. 20 new inspector positions across the province to support the inspection and oversight of licensed residential placements. We boosted the number of inspections and we've increased the number of foster home inspections for each license renewal. And to increase transparency, we started publicly posting license information, something that the previous government, supported by the NDP, never bothered to do. So don't tell me who's playing politics. I know very well who's playing politics. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Once again, I'll ask the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. This week, Infrastructure Ontario released a new market update revealing significant cost increases and delays for several of the government's public private partnerships. The last of the Ontario Line P3 contracts is now expected to be finalized in 2026, an unexplained four year delay from the date in IO's 2019 market update. And earlier this month, IO signed a P3 contract for the Ontario Line South package that will cost an astonishing $1 billion per kilometer. And just five years ago, for comparison, the Toronto York Spadina subway extension cost $383 million per kilometer, a far cry from a billion per click. Why have subway costs gone up by more than two and a half times under this Premier? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, an ironic question from the member opposite, but Speaker, let's start with the fact that, as the member should well know, that construction project costs around the world are facing economic pressures with rising inflation and supply chain challenges. Speaker, um, I'm glad though that the member brings up the Ontario line because this government is the only government that is filling the transit gap that was left by the NDP and the Liberals for decades. Speaker, we're taking action. We're, at, we're taking action to fill that gap and putting forward the largest transit expansion plan in Canadian history to the tune of $61 billion. So let's look at the facts, Speaker. The Ontario Line will see almost 400,000 passengers every single day. It will reduce crowding on existing subways. This will put 57,000 jobs within 45 minutes commuting to Toronto and will put 227,000 people to work, Speaker. We're not going to take any lessons from the NDP on building transit. They simply didn't do it. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And according, and this, my question is to the Premier. According to the Toronto Star, the Premier's decision to take over the Ontario line from the City of Toronto was proposed by one Michael Chavez, a private consultant who has embedded himself at the executive level of Metrolinx, a public transit agency. Another embedded private consultant who worked on the Ontario line was Brian Guess, currently embroiled in the Ottawa LRT P3 fiasco and under allegations of conflict of interest. And the Ontario Line's project director was yet another embedded private consultant named Richard Tucker, whose background is actually in real estate development and not in transit. Speaker, will the Premier admit that there is a connection between the skyrocketing P3 costs and the capture of Metrolinx by private self-serving consultants? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. I'll remind 
comments through the floor. Speaker, I guess the irony thickens in the supplemental. The reality is, Speaker, that member voted against every single measure to build transit and now questions when this government actually gets it done. In fact, it was that party who called the plan to build the Ontario Line fiction, back of a napkin plan. Well, Order. I see shovels in the ground, Speaker. The reality is these lines are getting built. Well, speaker, that member and that party not only voted against the Ontario Line, they voted against the Eglinton West extension, Order. getting us to Pearson Airport. They voted against Order. the fine people of Scarborough with the Shepherd East extension. They voted against the Young North extension and, of course, the Ontario Line. Speaker, they even voted against $1.6 billion in safe restart funding to keep transit agencies alive during the pandemic. Speaker, Order. the reality is the NDP, if they had it their way, there'd be no transit in Ontario. This is the only government getting it done for computer, commuters in Ontario. The member for Waterloo will come to order. The member for Brampton North will come to order. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, I ask this question. Like nearly every jurisdiction globally, Ontario is experiencing a labour shortage across almost every sector. At the same time, there are young people in this province who cannot find a job. This is unacceptable. The skilled trades require more individuals than ever to fill those prosperous and respected careers that will provide stability for those workers and their families. By 2026, it is expected that one in five job openings in this province will be in the skilled trades-related occupations. Ontarians expect their government to continuously update initiatives and make investments for all students, ensuring they have the skills required to succeed in the modern world. Speaker, can the Minister of Education please update this House on how our government provides the tools to our youngest learners who need to succeed? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Thornhill for the question, and I want to build on the passion of the Associate Minister of Transportation in this House. Um, by recognizing that this government under Premier Ford has a $160 billion infrastructure plan to build subways and hospitals and schools and transit in every region of this province. And Mr. Speaker, to do that, we need people, a talent pool of young, ambitious young uh, people who are ready to take on the jobs of tomorrow. And that's why, Speaker, we brought forth a plan to expand skilled training within our schools, because the broader vision from this government is to ensure the next generation of workers and thinkers and entrepreneurs are financially literate, are emotionally intelligent, are, um, are ready for the jobs of tomorrow and have the technological fluency that they need to succeed. Mr. Speaker, we know so many young people still cannot get a job related to their skills. Our vision and our investment Spons? today expands the dual credit program to allow more young people to learn within our high schools and get a job at the end of their journey. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his valuable information. Speaker, it is a fact that a career in the skilled trades is both in demand and well-paying. I am grateful that our government is making a significant effort to support our young people, which will help our economy uh, prosper now and in the future. It is also encouraging to hear the minister say the dual credit program that our students readily have access to is a priority and properly funded. Speaker, to the Minister of Education, will he please outline how many students will benefit from this program extension and how it will help and provide economic stability in a key sector of our economy? Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to just note that today, with the member from Scarborough Centre, Ajax, and the Minister of Finance, we joined together to announce a major expansion of the dual credit program, which allows students in high school to take uh, college courses to complete towards their apprenticeship training. This is allowing young people who otherwise likely wouldn't graduate not only complete their learning, but get access to a high-wage career. It is very promising, a 30 per cent increase announced by this government today in apprenticeship learning within our schools. 2,200 more young people in the coming year will benefit from this learning 
in addition to a curriculum that finally is labour market aligned, ensuring that young people learn skills they can apply and can monetize in a competitive global economy. Our vision and our mission is clear. We want young people to graduate with the skills necessary to compete and succeed in the world. Thank you. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Bill 23 is about to eviscerate Toronto's affordable housing construction program. Yep. Removing housing services from development charges is going to cost the city $230 million in revenue. Yep. It will restrict Toronto's ability to deliver on its 10-year housing targets, yep. invest in new shelter services, and carry on with several of its affordable housing development and protection programs. Will the government help Toronto deliver its affordable housing plan and cover the loss in development fees? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, without the New Democrat support, we're supporting uh, Mayor Tory uh, with providing him strong mayor powers to help him meet his goal of his share of the 1.5 million homes we're going to be building over the next 10 years as part of our housing supply action plan. And despite the the NIMBY chants from New Democrats, uh, we're going to continue to work with Mayor Tory and the City of Toronto so that they can, they can meet those targets in partnership. We're going to continue to provide them the tools to get shovels in the ground faster. And again, the member uh, has to realize that the, the most significant changes in development charges are exactly the type of homes that she talked about in her question. The deepest uh, differences in development charges are for affordable housing, attainable housing and inclusionary zoning units. I, I think we can agree, or maybe she doesn't agree, that that's the type of housing that Torontonians need. Here, here. Supplementary. Uh, thank you. Back to the Premier. We can protect our democratic norms and build housing at the same time. It's not one or the other. The money that is received from development charges is already committed, and ignoring the revenue losses from Bill 23 risks virtually every significant program Toronto has to provide affordable housing. Giving the Mayor the power to pass bylaws over the objections of two-thirds of Toronto's elected council will do nothing to fix that. What is the government's plan to help municipalities build truly affordable and supportive housing? Mr. I just told that member how we're going to incent affordable housing. We've supported uh, our municipal partners throughout the pandemic. We provided, under the leadership of Premier Ford, a historic agreement that provided our municipal partners with over $4 billion to ensure that they had the tools. But again, Speaker, this member speaks against uh, the strong mayor powers in Bill 39. I want to remind her that John Tory won a citywide mandate with over 342,000 votes, 36,000 more votes than every city councillor combined. He has a citywide mandate to get shovels in the ground. We're going to give him the tools to get it done. Here, here. Thank you. Next question, member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Under the previous Liberal government, the people of Ontario were subjected to the largest regulatory burden in all of Canada. People and business were overwhelmed by red tape and high taxes. In my riding of Perth Wellington, unnecessary bureaucracy drove away jobs, investments and opportunities for small businesses and farm families in my community. Our government must implement better solutions to help people and businesses save time and money. While many regulations are essential to protecting people's health, safety and environment, nobody benefits from outdated, duplicative or over-complex rules. Speaker, what action is our government taking to reduce unnecessary red tape to make life easier for people and businesses in Ontario? Minister of Red Tape Reduction. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member from Perth, Wellington, for that important question, Mr. Speaker. We all know for 15 years under the former Liberal government, supported by the NDP, Mr. Speaker, and their failed policies drove away over 300,000 jobs out of our province, all thanks to the unnecessary red tape burden that they created in the province of Ontario. 
Mr. Speaker, thankfully, those days are behind us now, Mr. Speaker. Now we have a government that is truly committed to creating jobs and creating opportunities and reducing unnecessary red tape burden. Since 2018, our government has reduced unnecessary burdens, Mr. Speaker, and red tape that held back economic growth and prosperity in our province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We reduced Ontario's total regulatory burden, Mr. Speaker, by Response? six and a half percent, wow. which led to over half a billion dollars savings in compliances for businesses, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Red Tape Production for his answer, and it's great news. I'm proud of our government's leadership that is correcting years of mismanagement and unnecessary red tape to implemented under the previous Liberal government. During these times of global economic uncertainty, it's vital that we, as a government, take prudent action in providing stability and support to our business community. Reducing red tape on individuals and businesses is a key measure that this government can take to support a robust economic environment, ensuring our small businesses have confidence. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House what is being done to continue to elim eliminate complicated, duplicative, and unnecessary red tape? Minister of Red Tape Production. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for that question again. He is absolutely right about the need to continue moving forward with our work to reduce the unnecessary red tape, Mr. Speaker. That's why yesterday I was honoured to introduce Let's Red Tape Stronger Ontario Act in the legislature, Mr. Speaker. If passed, this bill will help Ontario become more competitive, strengthen our local supply chain, and make Ontario services easier to access and interact with Mr. Speaker. It includes measures to increase local food production and efforts to ensure our food supply chain, Mr. Speaker. It includes measures to get goods to market and improve supply chain efficiency, Mr. Speaker. We have been working hard each and every day on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, to work with Ontarians, to work with businesses, to find ways to eliminate unnecessary red tape. We're getting it done, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. The minister, my question is to the Minister of Health. The Ministry of Health acknowledged in a memo this week that Ontario is facing a difficult and complex respiratory illness season. The government's solution to this? They're asking family doctors to do more. The minister should know that the health care crisis includes a shortage of doctors. There just in that aren't enough enough Sorry, there just aren't enough primary care physicians. More than 1 million Ontarians today don't have a family doctor. That is projected to rise to 3 million or 1 in 5 by 2025. What is the government's plan to address the doctor shortage? Mr. Health. You know, Speaker, um, imagine, if you will, when the Auditor General's report came out in 2012 and highlighted the shortage of family physicians in Northern Ontario, they were down by, they needed an additional 200 family physicians. Imagine in 2012, when the Liberal government was in power, if we'd actually actioned that highlight and that concern. In contrast, I will point to the fact that we have now added an additional 160 undergraduate spots. We have added an additional 295 postgraduate positions. These are positions and opportunities for Ontario residents and individuals who want to practice family medicine in the province of Ontario. They will have that expanded opportunity in the next five years. I am concerned that the member opposite and the party opposite wasn't calling for more action when they had the opportunity to do that in 2018, and the Auditor General was highlighting the uh, issue. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. 
My constituent Jacqueline and her husband Donald are an aging couple who were left to scramble to find a new family doctor this August after theirs retired. Donald is 90 years old and has been treated for prostate cancer for the last 20 years, and Jacqueline has been his primary caregiver at home as he needs supervision and help with everyday tasks. They are scared because they are running out of time to find someone to guide them through Donald's treatment and feel that they have nowhere to turn. The shortage of family doctors in this province is literally a situation of life or death. How much longer will Jacqueline and Donald have to wait? Minister of Health. The member opposite highlights the exact reason why, in the summer, I sent a minister's directive to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario saying any individuals who have been internationally educated or practiced in other jurisdictions have the opportunity to get their, their uh, qualifications assessed, reviewed, and ultimately licensed if appropriate. It is precisely why we have done some of those short, uh, medium, and long-term goals, because we understand there are immediate needs in our community today right now, but we also understand that you must plan for the future, which, bluntly speaker, previous governments did not do. We are making those investments now to make sure that this is not an ongoing problem in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa, Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I wish to bring a very important issue to this government's attention that doesn't seem to be on the radar. Solitary confinement, a process broadly recognized to be torture, is still being used as a disciplinary tool in our Ontario jails. This ineffective punishment is commonly afflicted on inmates with mental health conditions which are worsened by the cruel and disorienting practice of solitary confinement. Administrative segregation may need to be used occasionally to keep inmates safe, but it should be humane and should not be used as a punishment. We need a much stronger system of accountability with tribunals to verify whether administrative segregation is the only course of action to keep inmates safe. My question is, will the government do everything in its power to make sure that our jails are not places in which people are being tortured? To reply for the government, the parliamentary assistant member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Well, thank you, uh, and thank you to the member opposite for that question. You know, community safety is a top priority for this government. Not those, not for those who just work and support our justice system, but to all Ontario families. We have been strengthening our justice system from top to bottom, guided by three goals: keeping communities safe, holding offenders accountable, and delivering justice for the people of Ontario. We have been clear that the segregation that was allowed to drag on unconscionably by the previous governments will not stand under our watch. The record shows that we have had a four-year moratorium on all correctional officers' recruitment instituted under the Wynne Del Duca Liberals Shame. to thank for those conditions that now our government is facing. God. It is our progressive Conservative government that has made changes to ensure segregation is not overused. To continue this progress, we have made Fox. landmark investments of over $500 million in the correctional system, including the hiring of 500 new staff and bringing infrastructure and investments to the staff. We are very Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, people with mental health struggles are dramatically overrepresented in Ontario's prison, and that's a fact. Part of the problem is that police are the main responders for mental health crisis, which results in people with addictions and mental health issues being put into the justice system instead of receiving the care that they need. Mobile crisis response teams help avoid this by facilitating partnerships between police and mental health and addictions professional. Yesterday, I met with mental health and addictions professional who see the heartbreaking effects of this issue every day. And they told me that the funding for these teams is insufficient to address the need for recruitment and retention. People experiencing a mental health or addiction crisis are in need of health care, not jail time. So what is the government doing to expand Russia. mobile crisis response teams for these essential services so we can keep people out of the justice system and save taxpayers money? Any response? 
The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question because it is something that our government takes very seriously. As everyone knows in this House, our government is investing $525,000 in annualized, sorry, $525 million in annualized amount to ensure that we build a continuum of care. And one of the things that we look at is not just the treatment and the, uh, the uh, 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 detox. We're also looking at ways that we can divert people away from the emergency rooms and the justice system. And one of those methods is to have mobile crisis intervention teams. And Mr. Speaker, I can say that under this government, we've had more teams established, both under the Ministry of Health Investments under the, uh, and under the watch of the Solicitor General, to ensure that these teams are in place to ensure that people are getting Response. the appropriate treatment when and where they need it and brought to places where they can truly get help and not necessarily in the correction system. Yeah. Next question, member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are all aware of the added strain that the pandemic caused on our health care system. This strain is not only occurring in Ontario, but is being experienced across Canada. Because of the policies of neglect and mismanagement from the previous Liberal government, our healthcare workforce faces huge challenges. To address our current healthcare system needs, we must expand our workforce, starting with recruiting and training new healthcare professionals. It is particularly important in smaller communities that often first severe staffing shortages. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Colleges and Universities please explain what our government is doing to train more frontline healthcare professionals? Thank you. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. Coming from a rural area myself, I've seen firsthand the challenges that smaller communities have faced because of the pandemic. While we have seen some of the best and brightest working in our hospitals and healthcare facilities, we recognize that we can always do more to ensure that they are supported and that staffing levels are meeting the demands of our system. Last year alone, we had over 25,000 nursing students studying at an Ontario college or university. And since 2016, our post-secondary institutions are graduating on average 15 per cent more nurses than before. It's not about getting students in class, it's also about investing in their education. That's why our government is investing $124 million over the next three years to support the clinical education of student nurses to get the hands-on training they need to succeed, training that they simply cannot get in the classroom. The people of Ontario can be assured that the world-class training our grads receive will have them job-ready and able to tackle even the most Response. challenging times in our health care system. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that wonderful answer. I appreciate what the Minister had to say about investing in Ontario nurses, but we must ensure that this support go towards the region with the highest need. Rural, remote and northern Ontario communities continue to face severe shortage of healthcare human resources professionals. With retiring healthcare professionals leaving the field, young people are not filling to the job they needed to maintain the same level of care for residents. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please outline what our government is doing to ensure that the residents of rural, remote, and northern Ontario communities continue to receive access to health care professionals? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member. I've been working closely with the, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Long-Term Care, to ensure that we are not only fostering education for health care professionals, but that we are also addressing specific regional and community health care needs across the province. Earlier this year, our government launched the Ontario Learn and Stay Grant, which is going to be a huge asset for underserved communities. In the simplest of terms, if a student enrolls in a school in an underserved community, takes one of the identified programs of need, and commits to working in that community in their area of study for two years, the government will cover their education. Through this grant, we are investing $61 million to support 2,500 new health care professionals, in addition to the thousands more we are supporting through various ministry initiatives. 
Whether you are in North Bay, Sarnia, Belleville, Thunder Bay, or in any other identified communities, local colleges and universities will be training the next generation of healthcare professionals that will support local healthcare needs. I'm very excited about the Learn and Stay grant and look forward to sharing an update in this House about its success in the future. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you. Gas prices remain far higher in Northern Ontario than in the South. In the Northwest, the average cost of gas was 30 cents more per litre than in the Greater Toronto Area. Even in the North, the price can range drastically from town to town for no discernible reason. Can the Premier explain to Northerners why there are such huge differences in the price of gas across the province? And to respond, Member for Kitchener, South Hester, Environmental Assistance. Thank you, Speaker. Um, we, of course, know that Ontario families and workers are being affected by uh, inflation and high global gas prices, and it's particularly true in northern Ontario. Um, obviously, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has had uh, geopolitical consequences that Ontario is not immune to. Our government has been uh, taking numerous steps back in 2018, scrapping uh, cap-and-trade and then recently extending the uh, 5.7 cent uh, gas tax gas uh, tax cut for another uh, another year my um, my issue would be the the sort of hypocrisy of that question coming from the ndp i'm going to ask the member to withdraw the unparliamentary remark the question coming from the ndp that seems to okay. member will take her seat stop the clock yeah member must withdraw the unparliamentary remark okay. You have to stand up and say it. Just a start the clock. I withdraw. And conclude the response. Uh, coming from the NDP, where um, if the uh, party cared about gas prices, I would suggest turning their advocacy to the uh, federal uh, carbon tax or perhaps to the members' uh, own party. Um, Individuals in which campaigned on a promise of a 35 cent gas tax increase, which would cost Ontario families literally thousands. The answer is simple, Speaker. Oil and gas companies who continue to rack up huge profits. Government side, come to order. All right. Oil and gas companies who continue to rack up huge profits are gouging people in the north. Just ask the Minister of Northern Development, who said last week, I can't explain the price variations in the north. It's a bit of a Wild West phenomenon. Will the Premier rein in the companies who are gouging northerners and end gas price gouging in Ontario? And to reply, the Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you to the member opposite. Uh, I don't know, breaking news, uh, Ontario and Canada are part of the global economy. We're affected by the global supply chains and the price of oil and gas around the planet. But, Mr. Speaker, let me say this. For the 8 million drivers in Ontario, many, I'm taking the subway to my next meeting right after this, but many in this province can't drive their kids, uh, can't take a subway to take their kids to school, can't uh, take a subway to work. They have to drive to get to work. We're providing relief to those 8 million drivers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me also say this. In the fall economic statement, we're also helping others, including those on Ontario Disability Program. We increased the earning exemption from $200 to $1,000 a month. And Mr. Speaker, I quote from uh, the CEO, the newly appointed CEO of the Ability Centre. I'll, I'll quote, today's uh, ODSP policy announcement in the Fez are a game changer. Wow. The changes to ODSP clawbacks Fantastic. are the most significant policy change since the beginning of ODSP. Yeah, yeah. Next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacoke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. Because of the leadership demonstrated by our government, we are ensuring that all Ontarians have an opportunity to participate in our growing economy. We recognize that Indigenous communities deserve reliable sources of energy, they deserve infrastructure that connects them to our province, and they deserve the opportunity to participate fully and meaningfully in our shared economy prosperity. Speaker, can the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development please inform the House on how our government plans to increase economic prosperity across the North? 
Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to uh, thank the member for the question. I have some great news today, Mr. Speaker. The community of Kingfisher uh, First Nation, one of our isolated communities in the north, the member from Kiwaitnung comes from there, is going off diesel generation, Mr. Wow. Speaker. Our, led, our government led the charge, Mr. Speaker, after a long period of time where the previous government was slow to the mark on this. And, and there are 24 communities in the Wate Power Group. 17 of them are isolated, Mr. Speaker. They're onboarding now. They're building an 1,800-kilometer line that will help improve uh, electricity capacity and stability in these communities. Chief Mamakwa, I think, said it best. Access to reliable energy will lead to many improvements for our people and the community. Schools, households, businesses have been Bucks. negatively impacted by frequent power outages. Improvements to health care, education, food security, and technology are on the way. That's something to celebrate. Mr. Yeah. Supplementary question. Speaker, thank you uh, to the minister for his response. Under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, they drove jobs out of our province and failed to unlock Ontario's full economic potential, especially for the people of Northern Ontario. Speaker, we do not believe that this is fair. It is clear that transformational investments in infrastructure will lead to long-term economic growth across all of Ontario and deliver investments for the North. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate further about the importance of supporting Indigenous-led projects and the benefits they will provide for their communities in rural, remote, northern areas of our province? Thank you. Mr. Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have the Wate Power Line. We have the East-West High, Mr. Speaker. What's next? Well, I'll tell you about some isolated communities just to the east of the Wate Power communities. They are in Yabmatum, Niskandiga. Nibinimak, Webequay, and Martin Falls, Mr. Speaker. These communities have a couple things in common. Yes, Mr. Speaker, they surround the Ring of Fire, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to unleash the potential of the North and be involved in a fully integrated supply chain from earth to electric vehicles, Mr. Speaker, the single biggest environmental policy that any sub-sovereign government could advance. But it's also an opportunity for the corridor to prosperity to bring the same kinds of things that Chief Mamakwa talked about. Better elect sources of electricity, new opportunities for businesses in that region so that young Indigenous Response. people have a fair line to a good job. It's time to rally behind the corridor to prosperity. Will the NDP, Mr. Speaker, stand with us when we make those kinds of investments? Next question, member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Earlier this week, I was proud to table a motion to ensure that key tests for detecting prostate cancer is fully covered under our university health care system. One in eight Canadian men are expected to receive a prostate cancer diagnosis in their lifetime. 28 will be diagnosed with prostate cancer today in the province of Ontario. We also know that black men are significantly higher risk of getting prostate cancer. This year, 10,500 people will receive the horrible news they have prostate cancer. 1,750 will die. That means nearly five people will die every day with prostate cancer. 100% of the people that are detected early with prostate cancer will survive five years or longer. So my question is early detection using PST tests can Questions? save lives. Will the government move forward on this motion and ensure that no barriers to early detection of prostate cancer in Ontario? Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the member opposite for raising this important issue and highlighting the value that uh, we have and we have put in the province of Ontario on the early de detection because we understand that early de detection and ultimately treatment leads to uh, far better outcomes. Um, based on clinical guidelines established by the Canadian Task Force on Preventative Health Care, OHIP currently funds prostate-specific antigen tests for men who are, one, receiving treatment for prostate cancer, two, being followed for treatment for prostate cancer, and third, suspected of prostate cancer because of their family history and the results of their physical exam. 
Absolutely. Ontarians who are concerned should be speaking to their primary care physicians because they can get that test through those conversations if the family physician clinically assesses and deems that Fonts. that is appropriate. Thank you. Minister, in my riding, they're running golf tournaments in Fort Erie to pay for the test. Nobody should have to run a golf tournament to pay for a prostate test in this country or this province. Speaker, back to the Premier. Across our current country, currently, eight out of ten provinces and three territories fully cover the PSA test when requested by a physician. That means Ontario is one of the few exceptions across Canada when it comes to ensuring everyone has equal access to this test. This test is an important tool in the toolbox for physicians to ensure early detection of prostate cancer. Early detection will save lives and money, upwards to $16 million in our health care system. For the second time, I was happy to be joined by Dr. Edmonds from the Canadian Cancer Society to introduce my motion. He was able to discuss the importance of early detection. Why does the Question. government refuse to join eight provinces, three territories, and listen to the Canadian Cancer Society and cover the PSA test for those with a prostate in Ontario so we can save lives? Thank you. Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker. And again, uh, I absolutely support the members' advocacy on early detection and having those conversations with your primary care physicians. But most international and national gu guidelines and recommendations are included, including the Canadian Task Force on Preventative Health Care, the United States Preventative Services Task Force, and the American College of Physicians. They recommend against screening for prostate cancer against the PSA test, using the PSA test due to the lack of evidence. We need to have clinicians making these decisions, not politicians. Absolutely have the conversations with your primary care physicians, but let's leave the clinical advice to the clinicians and the experts in the field. Thank you. Next question, the member for Flamborough, Lambert. Thank you, Speaker. We are hearing alarming reports in the media about a sewage spill in Hamilton. As reported, this spill has been ongoing for the past 26 years. From reports in the media, the spill was only discovered inadvertently from previous video footage. The people of my riding and all Hamiltonians are concerned now about the soundness of our community's water infrastructure system. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. What is our government doing to protect Hamilton's water infrastructure to stop events like this from happening again? Mr. The Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for that question and her important advocacy and leadership for the people of Hamilton. Uh, speaker, let me be abundantly clear, this is absolutely unacceptable. Upon hearing of the situation in Hamilton, I was angry, like many of the good people of Hamilton, including my family that live there. I was angry for the people who are yet again hearing about how their city um, and the lack of oversight has prepared or failed to protect uh, their waters. Speaker, I was angry that this lack of oversight has happened for 26 years, Speaker, even after all that the people of Hamilton have gone through. I'm happy to report, Speaker, that upon notification of the spill, my ministry took immediate action. We've sent an environmental officer over uh, to Hamilton, who's working closely with the municipality to block any further sewage flow, to stop further environmental damage, and move immediately to address this situation. I look forward to informing the legislature of further action that this government's taking in the, in the supplemental. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's clear that action needs to be taken and that questions need to be answered on behalf of the people of Hamilton. Serious problems related to water infrastructure and environmental safety standards should never take over two decades to be addressed. From media reports, it appears that the system of due diligence and oversight was lacking for an extended period of time. The people of Hamilton deserve better regarding their critical water infrastructure system. Speaker, what further action is our government, and in particular, the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, pursuing to ensure that this situation is properly addressed? Through the environment. 
you, Speaker. Uh, I thank the member for that question. Again, the continued lack of oversight is simply unacceptable. And I had a very good conversation with the new uh, mayor of Hamilton, Speaker, and I commend her for speaking of transparency, for speaking of being transparent with the people of Hamilton, Speaker. I and our government agree. That's why, a Speaker, immediately upon learning of this, later, of this latest spill and speaking with the Mayor of Hamilton, I've instructed my ministry to require Hamilton uh, to audit its entire sewage infrastructure and come up with a remediation plan to clean this mess up. We're going to work closely with the new Mayor and the City of Hamilton to address this so that this never happens again. It's unacceptable. The people deserve better. And thanks to this member from Hamilton, they're going to get it. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Nickelbell. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. The Ontario Association of Medical Radiation Sciences is here today. They represent radiation therapists, sonographer, radiological, nuclear medicine, and MRI technologists. They are the healthcare professional who perform critical diagnostic tests and therapy on the front line of our healthcare system. They recently polled their members who said they are overworked burnt out, and facing the same staffing shortages as all professional working in healthcare right now. This is a message that all healthcare workers are trying to get the government to acknowledge, to respond to. Minister, how long will the government take before they take actions to deal with this health human resources crisis in medical radiation sciences? Mr. Health. Thank you for raising this uh, important question, and you know, I, I want to also acknowledge the incredible work that all of our allied health professionals have been doing throughout the pandemic, whether it was prior to vaccines, uh, the, the incredible assistance that happened. Again, entire healthcare system stepping up and making sure that Canada and Ontario was second in the world, Speaker, to make sure that our, uh, our citizens were protected. Um, you know, when will the work start? It started in 2020 when we as a government made an investment and said we are building a stronger, more robust health care system by ad adding an additional 12,000 health human resources. We're doing it with investments in our colleges. We're doing it investments in new um, positions available for young people who want to be in the healthcare professionals. We've started that in 2020. We will continue to do that work. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you. The Association of Medical Radiation Science is just the latest group of health professionals raising concern about understaffing. The backlog of diagnostic MRI, CAT scan, PET scan will not improve without them. Today, representatives from 295,000 healthcare workers are here to try to get the government to pay attention to this crisis, to listen to their solution. Will the minister agree? to listen to health representatives from OCHU, QP, ONA, OPSUSEFO, UNIFOR, and SEIU who are here today at Queen's Park. They have solutions. Will you meet with them? Again, I will say I am open and available to all innovation and ideas that people bring forward. You know, the, the Premier and I had an opportunity to have a roundtable with the, uh, the representation of nurses, and the ideas coming forward, we're now driving those forward and saying, how can we implement that? How can we add to what we've already done with the Learn and Stay program to ensure that young people who want to train as RNs in the province of Ontario have that opportunity through free tuition and books. How do we expand the opportunities so that we do not have a continuation of the backlogs in diagnostic imaging and other uh, critically important services that the people of Ontario deserve in their communities? We've done that work. We will continue to have those conversations and, and listen to those innovations. And I am very proud of the fact that we have health care workers in the province of Ontario who continue to give 110 percent because they know it's what they can do in their community and it's what the people of Ontario expect. Next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Speaker, I'm proud to represent the great people of Oakville North Burlington, a community that is home 
to a thriving and innovative economy of entrepreneurs. Regrettably, under the previous Liberal government, the goal of unlocking entrepreneurship and business opportunities for women was not fully supported. The cost of childcare, red tape and taxes quickly spiraled out of control, making entrepreneurship too complex and costly. Thanks to the investments made by our government, Ontario is now seen as a competitive and supportive place for businesses to invest and create jobs. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity please explain what our government is doing to help young women entrepreneurs start and grow their businesses? Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, and commend her for the work that she's doing to bring forward a private member's motion to further the important work to end intimate partner violence. Now, Mr. Speaker, a contributing factor to intimate partner violence is economic hardship and women feeling like they are forced to return to bad situations. And that is why our government is getting more women into jobs than ever before. We are investing $117 million in employment and training supports so that women have access to training for in-demand skills. And we are making Ontario the best province to do business, and women are an integral part of that. As part of our plan to build Ontario, our government is investing a further $6.9 million to enhance the Investing in Women's Spons? Futures program and expanding it to up to 10 locations. I'm excited by this expansion. It's helped almost 6,000 women already, and this year hasn't ended. And Mr. Speaker, if you've heard me say it, when women succeed, Ontario succeeds. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for her response. Our entrepreneurs are a critical foundation to Ontario's economic growth and prosperity. But as we know, starting a business is hard work and filled with great risk. Unfortunately, under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, the dream of small business ownership was cha cha challenging and costly. Our government is reversing the harmful and destructive policies of the past. I know that small businesses in my, in my own community of Oakville North Burlington serve a vital role in the strength of our local economy. Speaker, can the minister share with us what our government is doing to help empower women to unlock their full economic potential through entrepreneurship opportunities? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the questions. Just look at the name of my ministry, Mr. Speaker, Social and Economic Opportunity. These two things have not been paired by accident. It's because our government knows that for women to thrive and succeed in Ontario's economy, they first need to overcome social barriers that are holding them back like uh, dealing with gender-based violence, trying to succeed in a field where women are underrepresented, or if you're trying to navigate the system and access services. If you have these barriers, you're not going to be able to take control of your economic future. And we are working to address those underlying issues so that women can enter entrepreneurship challenge-free and stay there. When I met with PARO, a women-led organization in Thunder Bay dedicated to advancing women and in investing in women's futures recipient, their services were able to help many women through the COVID-19 pandemic pivot from brick and mortar to the online market successfully and continue to grow their business in the post-pandemic economy. Mr. Speaker, if we're going to create a successful and robust post-pandemic economy, women must be at the forefront of the entrepreneurial and in leadership roles. And again, Mr. Speaker, when women succeed, Ontario succeeds. Thank you. The question period has concluded. Government House Leader on a point of order. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just rising in accordance with Standing Order 59 to uh, outline the uh, order of business for uh, next week. On uh, Monday, November 28th, uh, in the afternoon, we will proceed with Bill 46. Uh, Bill 46, the Less Red Tape, Stronger Ontario Act. We will continue with Bill 46 in the morning of Tuesday, November 29th. Uh, in the afternoon routine, uh, there will be a statement by the Ministry, uh, by the Minister 
uh, of, uh, by Minister Fullerton on the Wrapped Encourage campaign for Women Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, in the afternoon, we will again continue with Bill 46, and in the evening, um, uh, private members' business will be private members' notice of motion number 15th, uh, the member for uh, Windsor, Tecumseh. On Wednesday, November 30th, in the morning, back to Bill 46. In the afternoon, there will be a statement by uh, Minister McNaughton, McNaughton excuse me, um, on McIntyre powder. Afternoon, back to Bill 46. Uh, and in the evening, a uh, member's notice of motion number 19, standing in the name of the member for Oakville North Burlington. And on Tuesday, on Thursday, excuse me, December 1st, uh, in the morning, we will be back to Bill 26, strengthening post-secondary institutions and students act. In the afternoon, back to Bill 26. Uh, in the evening, uh, we will be dealing with uh, Bill 27, standing in the uh, the name of the member for Tamiskaming. To Ms. Gaming Cochran. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. We now have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 24, an act to amend the Regulated Health Professions Act 1991 and the Independent Health Facilities Act to address unfair fees charged to patients for health care services. Call in the members. This is a five minute bell.